Nobody who holds sacred the dignity of human life can be anything but sickened at the events attending the crash of the Viscount Hunyani. Survivors have the greatest call on the sympathy and assistance of every other human being. The horror of the crash was bad enough, but that this should have been compounded by murder of the most savage and treacherous sort leaves us stunned with disbelief and brings revulsion in the minds of anyone deserving the name human. This bestiality, worse than anything in recent history, stinks in the nostrils of heaven. But are we deafened with the voice of protest from nations who call themselves civilized? We are not. Like men in the story of the Good Samaritan, they pass by on the other side. One listens for loud condemnation by Dr. David Owen, himself a medical doctor, trained to extend mercy and help to all in need. One listens and the silence is deafening. One listens for loud condemnation by the President of the United States of America, himself a man from the Bible Baptist belt, and again the silence is deafening. One listens for loud condemnation by the Pope, by the Chief Rabbi, by the Archbishop of Canterbury, by all who love the name of God, and again the silence is deafening. up at about 10,000 feet and there was suddenly this terrific explosion which actually shook the plane. I saw the air hostess walking down the aisle actually stagger and almost fall and uh, we had instant fire on the starboard engine. Big fire, flames coming right back past even the last windows and there's panic on the plane. People were screaming and jumping up. Somebody was trying to open one of the escape uh, windows. The fire was still burning pretty strongly and I thought that we had no chance of even reaching the ground. I thought that wing would fall off long before we got near the ground. Anyway, uh, it must have taken us four or five minutes to get from the height we were down to ground level. I kept picking my head up from between my knees to see how close we were getting to the ground. And uh, the last thing the pilot said to us was, brace yourselves for impact and we hit, I gathered some trees to start off with and we bounced for a short while and then there was just a terrific impact, a fantastic noise and we were rolling. It felt a bit like I should imagine one would feel if you were thrown into a concrete mixer, the same sort of noise and same sort of feeling. We seemed to roll for a long time and suddenly uh, we were still and I thought, wow, I'm still alive, I didn't expect to be at all. And I immediately thought, I, you know, I've got to get out. This thing's going to burn. I could actually see flames from where I was. And I, I tried to head for the only little bit of daylight I could see and discovered my seatbelt was still done up. And I got that off and made for this small hole in the fuselage, which wasn't really big enough to get me out of. And I bent the bits of metal around. It was very sharp and jagged and managed to get out. And by that time, other people were moving in this section that we were in. And uh, I managed to pull the hole a little bit larger from the outside. I started pulling everybody through. Um, there was one poor chap stuck fairly near the hole, and his legs were jammed, and we couldn't get him out. And the fire was getting fiercer and fiercer all the time, and the fire was right near the hole that we were all getting out of. Anyway, eventually, uh, there didn't seem to be anybody else who we could get out. And I, I had to leave the plane because the fire was virtually burning on the hull at that stage. So I gathered all the survivors that we had lain down near the plane. Some of them were quite badly injured, especially the air hostesses. And uh, took them off to a little gully about 100 yards away from the plane. So I came back to see what we could do for the injured people there and we decided that we needed some bandages and we had seen a few suitcases scattered around at the scene of the wreck and myself and the Hansons decided to go back to the plane and see what we could salvage there to try and help these injured people. At this stage we were expecting somebody to come and rescue us any minute. I was worried that there were terrorists in the area. I knew there were. 
but uh, we thought help would be on its way pretty quick. Anyway, by this stage, the Hansons had got back to the plane and uh, were busy picking up a suitcase, and I was walking over towards them and got sort of halfway between the survivors and the plane. And I heard voices uh, just over to my left and sort of half turned to see where these voices were coming from. And as I did that, they just opened up on me, and I just saw red tracer flying all over the cracks as it went past me. And I dropped on the ground, and bullets were hitting all around me on the ground, and I thought, there's no future in lying here. So I got up and I ran. And they shot at me all the way up the slope until I got over the top, and I, I ran down a, a short slope. There's a little gully at the bottom. And I just jumped into this gully and lay up against the bank. I thought they'd follow me, and maybe I could grab one of them as he came over the top of the gully. And I hadn't lain there more than about four or five minutes, and I just heard a terrific uh, burst of firing as they opened up on, on all the other survivors that I'd left in the, in the gully. And I thought, you know, those poor people, that's them gone, because there was a, a long burst of firing and then short little bursts afterwards as they obviously finished off anybody who might still be moving. And there's, there's people in the gully. There was one, one old couple and six women and three little children, and most of them badly injured. They couldn't move at all. So, you know, even animals have some decency there, and they kill to eat. These people who did this, I think, are far, far worse.